Well, welcome everyone to the ESIP, ITNI, and CDI Tech Stack Working Group. Uh, my name is Tom Sori, and I'm a co-chair of the working group with Derek Masaki. Um, I am the Data Center and Systems Branch Chief at USGS in Eros at Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And happy today to introduce Chris Torbert, who is our Land Processes Distributed Active Archive, or LPDAC, manager here at Eros. And he'll give you a little bit of information about what the LPDAC is. And then Tom Marisberger, who is the LPDAC Chief Scientist. And Tom will be presenting a tool that they have developed called Appears today, um, which is used for data extraction, exploration, and visualization. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Tom Marisberger and Chris Torbert I, and let them do the presentation. Okay, thanks for the intro, Tom. And I'll get my slides going here. And uh, we'll let Chris kind of uh, uh, take the top matter. Um, everything look okay? Tom, we're still in, uh, we're not yet in presentation. There we go. Did it toggle? Yep. Okay. Look that, looks Chris. Great. that looks good. Hi, I'm Chris Torbert. Uh, so I know the, the purpose of uh, our presentation today is uh, to give a, an overview of uh, an application for extracting and exploring analysis ready samples, also known as appears. Uh, you know, it's a tool for quickly extracting time series data and quality information for point and area of locations so that users can visualize data within the application to explore their results. But before we get to that, um, I want to set the stage to briefly describe the LP DAC and the data that we steward. Um, and this should give some context to appears and how it fits within our community. So, Tom, if you would take us to the next slide. So the, the LP DAC, for those of you that, uh, that don't know, we are, a, um, we are a partnership between the U.S. Geological Survey and NASA. Um, we're one of, of 12 DACs within the, the NASA EOS DIS uh, organization. And we're located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota at uh, what we call the Eros Data Center. Next slide. So there's a typical picture of, of the, the 12 DACs with uh, LP there in South Dakota in the center. But as I, so keep this in mind, it adds context to appears when we get to that part of the, to the, uh, to the show. In fact, you know, I might even uh, point out the National Snow and Ice Data Center uh, is one of those that we'll, we'll try to integrate with closely. Also, Oak Ridge and CDAC are two of the other DACs that, uh, that, that appears works with. We hope to expand that. So go ahead, next slide. So at the LP DAC, we are we're 40, 40 plus scientists, engineers, and and other communications and support staff that, uh, that help bridge the, the gap between data and users. But you know, first and foremost, we're, we are an archive. Uh, so we, we're going to collect uh, uh, and manage remotely sensed data. Uh, and with that, our secondary purpose, purpose is to make that data available to, available to a, a wide varied user community of scientists and educators and students, uh, many others. Next slide. So a couple interesting little nuggets at, at the archive. I think we're I think we're actually closer to six petabytes today than we are five within our archive. Um, the data in our archive goes back to about 1981 up to the present. It keeps growing every day. We've we have at least one data set that's very fine resolution, although it's a very small data set as well, uh, at one millimeter. And But I think we're more known for our uh, higher, uh, lower resolution, but uh, larger pixels for the MODIS data. So that's the type of data that we've got. And all the data that we have at the DAC is available to uh, at no cost to the users. Next slide. 
and users. We, we do have a varied user community and it's, it's I think, reasonably large, getting closer to uh, 200,000 now. And it spans multiple uh, countries. Um, it's both commercial and government, education and other entities that, uh, that may download and use data from the LPDAC. Next slide. So there's a, a few missions that I'd say are, are somewhat core to what the LPDAC does, although this isn't a, a, a finite list at all. But EcoStress and JEDI are two missions that are on board the International Space Station. Uh, on Terra, uh, we've got the MODIS and ASTER instruments and we collect data from each of those. MODIS is also on Aqua, we collect that data. And VIRS, uh, currently today on SNPP, but also in the future JPSS, uh, we've got those data sets as well. And then finally, we've started to collect uh, data for the harmonized Landsat and Sentinel-2 data sets, HLS. And then from those missions, you know, there's a number of different data products that we, uh, that we just, you know, store, distribute. Um, reflectance and radiance being some of the key core ones, but also different vegetation indices such as the various index, uh, land surface temperature is another good one. Some of the disturbance uh, products that we've got like burned area, uh, there's cropland, land cover, a number of different uh, products that we provide to our end users. Now here's where I think it starts to it starts to get good. I'll pay attention here to the our data access points, the, the the data pool and DAC to disk, where users can basically come direct to us and download. If on the other hand you want to search the catalogs, there's a couple different ways to do it with Earth Data Search and Earth Explorer. Um, but there again, it's it uh, you, you pick your data, you download it. There are some services that can be placed on top of it, but it's still uh, very much a file-based uh, access method. And then finally, we get to the, the, the topic of the day, which is appears. Tom, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, it's a little so, laggy, sorry. Yep, yeah. no problem. So appears, now hit, uh, if, I, if I reference back a couple slides and, and say that, you know, appears is intended to cross multiple missions, multiple data sets, and in some cases, even multiple archives so that users can and look through their time series uh, and ultimately uh, visualize the data that we've got. So it's a, it's a pretty nifty tool. And I wanna say it, what it does is it exploits the interoperability of data among the archives. And so I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tom to, to give us a bit more detail on on the peers. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, before I kind of talk about appears functionality, uh, I kind of wanted to, to go back to to the vision a little bit, you know, why the, the why part. And, you know, we've had those sort of traditional search and order or bulk download capabilities. But, you know, we we have lots of use cases out in the community that are have been talking about sort of area of interest processing, doing some of the munging and stuff, bringing data sets together in, in a more easily uh, acquired way, um, these kinds of things. And, and in fact, we have, a, we have a user working group which um, has members from all our mission science teams and also members uh, from the community, remote sensing community at large, including agencies, academia, et cetera. And in about 2011, uh, doing some elicitation around um, gaps in, in user needs, um, the UWG kind of coined this phrase, which we kind of centered our appears vision on, even before it was called appears. And that was integrated data bundles a la carte. You know, I want MODIS and Landsat and, you know, maybe some other kinds of uh, variables you know, sort of all together in a data bundle that's nice and integrated, delivered to me in a way that I can use right away instead of, you know, downloading a bunch of files. So that, that was kind of the, the, the pivot point for this. 
Um, we created this value statement uh, a couple of years later, right around in the Big Earth Data Initiative and Climate Data Initiative era, um, as we were writing proposals trying to get uh, seed funding to kind of uh, stand up a capability or at least prototype it initially. So we kind of frame these in, in big data terms. And I think they kind of work. Uh, they still work to sort of show the value and then a little bit of a teaser towards the kind of functionality that we wouldn't want it to go towards. So in terms of these large data volumes that people have to grapple with and all the friction there, we would like to reduce those volumes at archive based on user-defined space-time variable subsets. Uh, the interoperability question, and, and this is not systems interoperability, but this is really data set interoperability, right? You've got things in different formats. You've got things in different coordinate reference systems. This is always a hassle, you know? A uh, lot of MODIS users hate sinusoidal, you know, et cetera. So, you know, we thought we would try to improve interoperability across this wide variety of things that people have to grapple with. Um, via format and coordinate reference system harmonization. Uh, we talk about velocity, uh, again, sort of data friction and, and coping with, with uh, big data. We'd like to increase the velocity of analysis. So you get these integrated data bundles, they've already been kind of pre-processed into an analysis ready or near analysis ready form. Um, that's really helpful. That's a time saving uh, thing for folks. But we also wanted to, to have this angle of data insight through these kind of interactive statistical graphs. You know, once you've extracted your data, you want to explore it a bit, you want to see how things vary, you want to get some sort of aggregate insight, you know, very kind of Tukey esque, you know, statistical sort of aggregate insight. And, and that's quite helpful. Um, you may choose not to download all the data that you pulled out because maybe the quality is not, you know, what you need for your project or something like that. So, so we give you a chance to do that. And then the veracity piece, which, you know, I, I think in our world, people might forget about a little bit, or, you know, maybe this should be the first one on the list, maybe instead of the last one on the list. But you know, our mission science teams and our data producers spend an extreme amount of time uh, building per pixel QA that nobody ever looks at. Um, when you uh, do your studies and stuff, if you don't pay attention to the quality um, of the data, you, you might do some things that are not really suited. So we really wanted to make those quality measures uh, inherent in these products more apparent and more usable. And so that was, that was another goal and a, a value uh, to the user. In terms of the, the product itself, we have the system, we call it a peers. Um, Torbert touched on the fact that there are distributed data stores that are being um, sort of mined. Um, and then we're kind of brokering the, the services. You know, we're not, when we're operating on NSIDC data, we're not bringing a local copy. We're only going out and pulling pieces from that archive. And so they're doing all the data management, you know, they're the, the archive of record. We're not changing any of that. Um, we do leverage some technologies like OpenDAP, a number of different kinds of web service implementations. Uh, we do have an API associated with the application and a UI. This is all open, it's been open sourced uh, as is NASA policy. Um, some other aspects of this, which really make it unique from, from some other uh, data access mechanisms. When I say land science driven, I mean, you know, our UWG really drove the initial recommendation. Other stakeholders like our mission science teams, uh, our science folks at Eros, uh, our communities at large, really were participants in the development of this tool. So all those use cases, um, all those voices uh, from conceptualization into early development, testing, iteration, refinement, adding data sets, adding features, all these kinds of things were really done with science folks embedded into, into the process. 
um, sleek interface. You know, it's easy to make thing, complicated things complicated. We wanted to make this sort of a, the workflow intuitive and easy to navigate. Simple uh, simultaneity, what I'm talking about there is maybe, maybe you've got 50 sites all across the Western US, right? They're all sort of dispersed all over the place. Normally, you know, the pattern would be go to that site, search for data, find the tiles or scenes or whatever that correspond to it, get those, then go way over here somewhere in another state and, you know, look for data at that site. Well, in this system, you just put all your sites in and the system sorts out uh, what, what underlying uh, tiles or scenes or swaths you're gonna need. Um, to some degree, this is a pixel liberation movement. Um, so it's not about searching and downloading, you know, these units that we're used to. It's more about, you know, give me a bunch of pixels over time or give me all the pixels that correspond to my area of interest over time, that sort of thing. The system never really shows you that, you know, that's 11,356 scenes returned to you. Uh, we do give you a scene list on the back end so that there's traceability, but you don't really have to be confronted with, you know, how many files you're interrogating. Um, some other kind of neat little things that it does that's sort of unique. You know, if you've got adjacent tiles, um, we'll auto mosaic those. Um, we'll clip to your area of interest. Um, we also, as I sort of alluded to before, auto extract and decode the quality bits to make those interpretable. Um, and so you can use them more readily. And you know that feature of the interactive data exploration. And this is really statistically after your data extraction, right? Most, most of these sort of mechanisms are like, we'll show you browse and you look at, you know, oh, does it look cloudy or not? I want this one, I want that one. We don't show you any of that geo visualization up front. We just let you extract and then you can sort of um, statistically um, uh, sort of assess how good that sample is. Um, in addition to the user value at a, a number of business goals, we're always interested in user satisfaction. We wanna increase the user base. We wanna increase uh, folk satisfaction. Um, there's an efficiency angle here to, uh, to be able to eliminate some at that time existing uh, sort of redundant or one capability to one data set approaches. Uh, collaboration, this has always been a business goal. We've, we've reached out to other DACs. We've worked with USGS Arrows. Um, it's good to work on, uh, you know, things where we can see intersecting interests and promote some common uh, services. And we kind of had a general performance goal of 95% of requests completed within 24 hours. Okay, and we mentioned some of the collaborators already. Um, we, we are the lead uh, in terms of the development uh, and so forth, and we maintain the services stack. Our collaborators are, are really those who link up with us and um, provide the data streams that uh, we broker the services with. <clears throat> so really it ends up, there's kind of two, two types, two main spatial types of extractions. And I'm a remote sensing geographer, so I always start with space. Um, but you can do point extractions and you can do area extractions. Okay, so uh, points basically uh, will get you that time series or even a static, you know, if there's just one layer, um, just the pixel. Uh, point extractions, the result of that is a, a CSV file. And so all the, all the values are written out in the CSV. We'll apply the scaling factors and everything, uh, write out the quality bits in there, decode them so that you have a nice, uh, a nice table form of, uh, of those data. The area extractions uh, produce rasters. Um, we can handle single simple rasters that you draw or single simple areas that you draw on the screen like a box or you can upload a shape file or a GeoJSON. It could have multiple features in it. Uh, that'll all be handled in one request. So if you go to the appears UI and and I, I would recommend, you know, anyone who's got a little bit of interest in this, 
go use it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through every gory detail about this, but just kind of give you a little bit of the workflow. It should be rather easy to figure out and easy to use. Um, but you can start with either an area or a point sample. There's a few ways to generate a request. We do, after you complete a request, we do write uh, those, those parameters that you use to process um, into, a, into a request file that you can replicate or share or whatever. So the processing provenance is there. Now it's quite easy to do. Um, for point extraction, you, you simply put in a request name. You can drag and drop a CSV if you got a, you know, 3,000 point locations or something. You can just drag and drop it in there. You can type them in. Um, so you do some specification of, of your uh, points of interest. Uh, there's time selection and uh, there's a date reoccurring uh, little modal there where if you just want seasonal or something like that, uh, you can set up a seasonal extraction temporarily. And then layers of interest. And really, this is, this is the simultaneity of, of uh, data sets. And so just in this little window here, you find your data sets and then you'll see all the various layers or bands within that data set. And when you click the little plus, it goes over to selected layers. And then, so you can go get some, you know, crack out a couple of modus variables from a modus product that you like, crack out a couple of variables from, you know, whatever number of pro uh, products you want. So, so you've kind of set up this time space um, variable of interest, um, and then you just hit submit and off we go. For area extraction, very similar workflow uh, with maybe one distinguishing feature. Um, again, sample name, you can drag and drop your shape file or your GeoJSON in that box, or you can go on the little uh, viewport there and, and draw a polygon if you, if you wanna be a little blunter, a little blunter instrument. Um, same type, type of time range uh, selection functionality, uh, same exact layer of interest functionality, um, but there are some output options now. And so this is where you could say, you know, take my modus data in sinusoidal and HDF and, you know, my Landsat ARD in, you know, CONUS equal area uh, and GeoTIFF and let's make those all into the same format and coordinate reference system. Um, you'll see the Proj4 strings if you do ask for reprojection. Um, we've constrained reprojection very heavily. Um, we, we only allow nearest neighbor resampling uh, and we don't allow aggregation at all. So, so your pixel size in is gonna be your pixel size out. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is we wanted to preserve the pixel level QA and the pixel level QA can't really come along um, if we did any sort of interpolation. Um, so that, that is one constraint, um, but it's there for a reason. Uh, once you're, you can, there's a page where you can monitor, you'll get email notifications when when your request was successful and uh, when it's done. Um, and, then, and then you go to the explore function. So we did the extraction, now we're ready to explore. A um, Couple of uh, high level examples here of, of the point extraction and air extraction results. Uh, for the points, now you can toggle through any point um, in that data bundle, you can see things like scatter plots. You can see time series. Um, you can zoom in and out on these graphs. You can change the axes, uh, zoom in on time. If you see anomalies, that kind of stuff. There's some very light uh, sort of quality filtering here where you got some options to, to toggle on the quality bits and sort of hide ones or show ones. Um, again, if you see some anomalies and, and you wanna kind of interact with that and explore it a little bit. Um, and again, these are not super sophisticated 
graphing techniques. You know, these aren't Hofmaler diagrams or anything super fancy. These are just very straightforward kind of time series and bar charts and and uh, and scatter plots and that kind of stuff. Um, for area, um, you know, you get these little box box and whisker plots when you have continuous variables. So you might imagine land surface temperature or NDVI or something like that varying over time for your area of interest. And so you can kind of interact with that and, and see how, um, you know, see what those variables are doing. Um, and then the second chart that's, that's uh, written below is the quality bits. And so, uh, you know, if you imagine you have 100,000 pixels or something in this area of interest, uh, the total of the uh, any given bar chart in the time series is 100,000. And then the different colors of the categories of quality. And so you know, sort of roll over these, you can see how quality varies. Um, you know, every product's a little different. Some have more arcane and sophisticated uh, quality bits. Some are more like, you know, cloud, water, land, or something like that. But um, you really do get a, a sense rather quickly and rather holistically um, about how your, uh, not only how your variables are, are varying, um, but how your quality is varying. Um, if you want to go and acquire um, data out of the extractions, um, Fairly similar for point and area. In point, as I mentioned, um, you'll get a CSV um, with all your point extracted data. You're also getting um, some supporting files, which includes some ISA metadata, uh, the granule list, which uh, again for provenance will let you know um, the, the list and the location uh, of all the files that had to be interrogated uh, for your extraction um, and your request JSON. So if you ever want to re uh, replicate that. Uh, for area extraction, your uh, outputs are, uh, in this case, TIFFs, you know, so they're rasters. Um, and in terms of supporting files, we have some ISO metadata. Uh, again, the, the granule list, uh, the JSON request file. We also provide a CSV, which is uh, statistics um, for every variable. And so, you know, you could just open that up and have, you know, for date X, the mean NDVI is Y. And so we, we've calculated that all out for, for easy reference. Um, for rasters, we also have a lookup table that we give you for the associated quality bits. And, uh, and so it's kind of a nice um, packaging. You can sort of download all and, and select pieces and parts out of this that you want. Um, so fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, you know, we took a look at the, at the GUI. There is an API. The API was developed a little bit later. Um, uh, was a requested feature that got a lot of support from the community. And so um, we do have a, a nice little API and that's being used quite regularly now um, for those who wanted to get at this functionality sort of programmatically. Um, a few results, I guess, to brag about uh, in terms of the impact of the system. Um, you know, this is our unique users per month. Uh, we're regularly over about a thousand, um, which on a monthly basis, uh, represents about 15% of the LPDAX users. So there's, there's definitely some headroom uh, to bring on new users, but you know, we sort of had this slower uh, kind of adoption. Uh, we released the point sampler first, the area sampler came about a year later, the API, maybe a year after that. Um, and we've been adding you know, more and more data sets as time goes on as well. I think we've got, 120 or so um, now. Um, so we will be interested to see if this is asymptotic or not, or you know, if, if uh, utilization will, will continue to grow. Um, 
data reduction, I think these numbers are maybe the most dramatic out of, out of any of them. Um, this, is, this is lifetime appears, right? So April, 2015 is when it was first released uh, through last month. Um, the volume of data accessed by requests is about 11 petabytes. Um, now, because it's a sampler, we know that we're gonna return bits and pieces, lots of smaller parts. Uh, so the volume the system's returned has been about 350 terabytes uh, against that 11 petabytes. And then users have chosen to download 190 terabytes out of that 358. Um, so from, from a user point of view, that's a lot of work <laughs> being done at the archive where you don't have to pull all that data um, across the wire and do all the sort of um, you know, prep work that you would normally have to do. So that volume reduction effect is, is you know, 97, 98, 99%, pretty dramatic. Uh, in terms of performance, this has varied over time and changed with optimizations and load and, and everything else. But um, just looking at the most recent three month average, a uh, quarter of our requests completed in 0 0.05 uh, hours which we call over coffee, 50% uh, completed in half an hour, 75% uh, uh, of requests over the last three months completed in about two hours. Um, we're very close to that initial business goal of, of you know, sort of overnight delivery uh, of 95% of the requests. And then of course, this distribution has a very long tail. So. Uh, if you're a person who puts in, a, you know, 2,000 points for, you know, daily modus surface temperature for 20 years, you know, spread out all over the globe or something, you're kind of in mega extraction world, right? We're going to have to touch a lot of files uh, to do that kind of data extraction. Um, but still, um, it's feasible. Uh, I talked about efficiency as being another business goal. And, you know, we had the modus reprojection tool on the web. That was, a, you know, really useful for, for grappling with sinusoidal and those kinds of things. We had the Weld WYSIWYG. This Weld was web-enabled Landsat data. It was like a version of data that David Roy uh, built for NASA. And it had a neat single pixel time series extraction function. Um, we had uh, GDEX, which was really kind of a, you know, clip and ship for digital elevation models. And so, you know, we brought a lot of this functionality um, together in a more modern application and added, you know, a lot of new features and sort of um, systematic functionality across a number of data sets. So, so we were eliminate, able to eliminate a bunch of these kind of niche things, which from a an o and M point of view made a lot of engineers happy. Um, user satisfaction. So it was, it was really neat because, you know, when we first came out with this thing, we thought, well, we've hit a, a, a solid stand up double. You know, this is, this is good. People are going to like this. But then we started getting all these, you know, kind of unsolicited testimonials and stuff. And we're like, wow, you know, this, this really was kind of a homer. Um, you know, and, and hearing people sort of um, express that it makes things easy, it makes things fast, it does a lot of work for them, um, it, it fits their use case. Um, it's say, you know, it, it's really just like, wow, you know, it, it really worked. This is really helping a lot of people. And interestingly, a lot of non-remote sensing um, experts so, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of people in, you know, uh, commercial ag companies, you know, um, we've got, uh, you know, people studying viruses and things, you know, epidemiologists that want to correlate, you know, malaria with, uh, you know, different types of vegetation uh, structure, functional traits. Um, you know, we've got researchers, obviously, with lots of study sites all over the place. Um, 
yeah, it's really been neat to see that uh, it's, a, it's an easy to use tool for, for those we might think are in kind of underserved communities or don't really have a lot of image processing expertise. Um, and then I'm just gonna close with a few screenshots of, you know, these are, these are actual user extractions, right? And, and again, you know, we look at these things and we say, wow, you know, this is sort of like what I imagine, at least as a geographer, you get all these really interesting patterns, right? And so for point samples, you've got very large ones, you know, when you have a colored dot here where it says 250 or 90 or something, that's 250 points under there. You don't really get to see them until you zoom in further. And so you have these sort of large and extensive things. You have this sort of these small and intensive things, you know, sort of regular sampling patterns, irregular sampling, sampling patterns. And, uh, you know, we're rangy enough that we can accommodate those things. Um, in terms of the area type of extractions, you know, you've got your real simple, I'll draw a box or I'll draw a polygon real quick. Um, could be a little area, it could be quite a large area. Uh, we've had people do you know, continental size and, and uh, there might have even been a, a couple of global, you know, coarse resolution modus um, types of operations. Um, if you want your very intricate shape files or GeoJSON areas of interest supported, again, you can, you can put those in. Um, in our appear screen, we'll render it uh, at a, a sort of more generalized level um, if, if there's a lot of points um, in, in the vector files, but, but, um, but that's just the representation. We'll actually preserve you know, all, the, all the nooks and crannies. Um, and then again, this idea where you can have uh, multiple areas of interest um, that could be adjacent or they could be, you know, well, you know, largely distributed, but we're gonna take care of those in one request. Um, so I think with that, I will probably um, throw it back to the moderator. Okay, thanks Tom. That's great. That was great presentation. Derek, are you going to Wanted to um, just check in on questions. I, I see a couple um, I, I, it looks like um, Chris might have already been answering uh, some of the questions that are in there. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and read these off or, or Tom uh, and Tom, if you want to take a look at them. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Yep. So the first one here uh, from Jack Eggleston, are there plans for LPDAC to add Landsat collection two level three ARD products? And, and the short answer to that is yes, we plan to, but we do have, uh, we have collection one today. Collection two is gonna take us a little bit of time. We've got uh, a few other priorities in terms of trying to integrate other data sets, but uh, so we'll, uh, it, it, it will get there one day, but I mean, at, at this point, we don't really have a schedule for moving from collection one to collection two. And hi, this is Jack. Um, and then I was particularly wondering about the level three data, which is these data sets are now, I think the most widely used or most uh, widely uh, downloaded data. So I'm wondering about the level three data. Yeah, so Jack, I mean, we, we're we very open to extending this um, to other data sets. At this point, you know, the feature set is very stable, the features and the functionality. We, we think of adding a data set more like a feature request at this point. And so there is some integration that's required and, you know, that that's resources and time and that kind of stuff. But, um, but we are very sort of voice of the user driven. And so, you know, if, if science wants something, um, we'd like to hear that so that we can sort of put it in consideration and, and think about ways that we could um, support those requests. Okay, great. We'll, we'll follow up with you then. Please do. And, and I would note that there is a, a feedback 
button in the appears application itself. That's also a good place to get voice of the user. Um, but you, you can feel free to, um, you know, reach out to us anytime as well. I know there's another, another question, question in there um, about yeah. TPM iMerge. Did, uh, did, can you see that one, Tom? Yeah, I, I can see that one. You know, here's um, at this moment in time, there isn't a plan for uh, for iMerge. However, I here's the there's a there's a technological aspect of this that I think is important. I know that iMerge is at the Goddard DAC, um, and as the DACs start moving onto similar platforms, namely Cumulus, the idea of merging uh, or integrating data sets from other DACs, actually the, the barriers for entry start to come down. So that's a, that's one of those data sets that, the, whereas today's answer is no, I think that becomes more of a, a, a real possibility in the not too distant future. Yeah, our user working group um, has, has tossed iMerge around. We've had a couple of brief discussions with Goddard DAC. I think we have an intent to do that. I think it's the timing. But I think, yeah, I think there are plenty of use cases uh, that would would um, leverage that. All right, I kind of want to open it up to questions. I think we got everything in chat. Um, any questions from the, the audience that you have for uh, today's presenters, Tom, Chris? I, I see. I do see another question out there from Jack. Um, so another data that's in science base, as opposed to say, the common metadata repository, we're sort of much of what we've shown today is driven out of that common metadata repository. So, um, so science base is not something that we're integrated with today. Um, it's it's really is a. It's more of a that that NASA as this platform that we're that uh, we depend on today, and the, the other part of it is OpenDAP, be it uh, IRAX or Threads. Either way, that's another dependency that we have today. On the other hand, Cog and other things uh, open up some other possibilities in the future. So, yeah, I think Jack, that's that's probably another sidebar topic that we could take up um, to kind of examine that a little bit. I mean. Chris is right in that, you know, most of our data sets are kind of in the NASA common metadata repository world, but we do work with some Eros data sets that are supported, you know, within the center with a little bit different implementation. And so, um, you know, it, it's likely feasible, um, but it would be good to understand uh, a little bit more about you know, normally if, if we have, we, we sort of have a process, right? So so if there is real interest and, and there seems to be a, a little bit of mass around um, looking closely at a data set for integration, we will we can do a data set assessment. And so we have some science staff um, that would work up um, kind of a little bit of how complicated would this be? You know, what are the implications of trying to support this or that data set. So, so we have some processes we could engage here to look at that. Okay, great. I'll definitely follow up with you. Thanks. Do we have anyone from science space? I thought I saw Shane Urbanowski from SAS. Um, did do we, if we have anyone uh, from the science space team or, or from SAS, did you want to uh, chime in and maybe make a connection? Um, taking science-based data and making it available through app ears. If Shane's still on, okay. I had a question then, um, and it's kind of, this is the tech stack part of um, th this presentation format. And I, I know we've got a couple members from the NG Talk delivery team. I see a couple from uh, Cloud DevOps. Um, the, the tech stack that you're currently using for appears is that entirely an on-prem system is there any uh has there been any conversation on moving that to uh, a cloud-based or a hybrid environment Herbert, you want to take that one sure yeah it's, it's really a timely question in fact 
So the answer today is it is all on-prem. We, we designed it with the idea that we would be moving it to the cloud. So in fact, in the next year, I would say that is gonna, that's gonna happen. It appears we'll, we'll sit within the Earth Data Cloud right next to the Cumulus system that you'll, you'll hear from out of Esdis and others. So um, I think that will, that's one of those things where I think it'll open us up for more opportunities for integrating other data sets from other DACs. So, um, so yes, uh, we, are, we do plan to move that to the cloud. And then on that note, that process where you said you develop the application first and then you develop the APIs. And this is something that we wrestle with as well from our delivery perspective. Are you gonna start developing the APIs first and then building your system so that you're both using and providing the, the APIs for delivery of data? You know, as uh, I guess, because we have both, we have the APIs today. Um, yeah. It should it should come as a package. Um, okay. So. Thanks. Yeah, I guess I would say, Derek. You know, one of the things that that, that we heard a lot again from our user working group and and people in the community at large is that as we sort of move and transition and migrate data sets to the cloud and migrate services to the cloud, that that folks really although there's a lot of forward looking folks who are excited about the new ways they'll be able to exploit data um, in that environment. There's, there are many, many folks who want continuity, right? So, right. so as we move this application, um, we're really trying to keep, we have a very successful sort of design and UX and, and people really like it. We're, we're trying not to really perturb that too much. And so, um, I think we'll have more opportunities to do new things sort of once we get there. Um, but for now, you know, we're, we're looking, you know, our main strategy is continuity. Right. All right. Just checking. Um, any, any other questions coming in on chat? There was one more. Uh, oh, yep, yeah, there is. Uh, is it possible to take advantage of the APIs and wrap it in another UI dashboard instead of appears? Um, can can you say a little bit more about that one? What what are you envisioning there? And that uh, is... Hi, uh, this is Navneet. Yep. Uh, so we already have a dashboard. Uh, to request data on other services like iMerge and uh, other data. So we are also, we also want to like uh, take charge of appear services and use it in our front end application. Yeah, I, I mean, you certainly can. You, you'd have to go out and, and look at the, you know, how the API is structured and the syntax and so forth. But, but we certainly have um, users and use cases um, that are, uh, you know, interrogating data, doing extractions, maybe even on a cron or something like that, um, sort of have it set up in the forward stream as new data become available to harvest and then build up sort of their database or something like that. Um, there's a gal at NAU who built a, uh, a shiny R app that sort of sits on top. It's kind of a UI that's associated with Phenocams. Um, and she's been extracting time series uh, at her Phenocam sites and then sort of integrating our data flow um, into a UI that lets users kind of go and interrogate <clears throat> these very sort of Phenocam based uh, look and feel um, through her UI. So, so I think these sorts of, um, you know, handoffs or um, you know, system um, interoperability or handshakes or whatever can happen. Yeah, I mean, that raises a good question. Do you anticipate that um, outside users would be rolling your APIs into production level routines? And, and if so, what obligation do you feel uh, to those, um, those potential users we, you know, we've been thinking about, do we need to use API keys, throttle the, the overall use? 
um, you know, how to be good stewards of the data, but also understand that um, maybe we don't want everything to be, you know, potentially rolled into uh, production um, level workflow where it may break or we may change it in the future. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a good point. I mean, we we have a lot of throttles in place. Okay. Um, we have a lot of queuing logic. Um, I mean, almost nothing we do is synchronous because we have to hit so many files to fulfill a request. Um, and so the, we've never had a promise of, of synchronicity uh, in terms of return. And so people have to sort of grapple with our request size constraints, our queuing logic, and the fact that this is really asynchronous um, so I guess, I guess that's where I sort of sit on that. I don't know, Torbert, maybe you have other thoughts. You know, it, it remind one of the challenges that we had initially up here was built on our, on our on-prem archive ECS, which was never really designed to handle the type of demand that we put on it for up here. So, um, so it's always been asynchronous in part because of that. Now, as we move to the cloud, it's, it will remain uh, asynchronous. Uh, on the other hand, the, the performance may be better uh, if we, it seems possible. All right. Any other questions out there? I think, um, I think we've kept up with everything in chat. Does anyone in the audience just wanna shout anything out? Okay. Well, you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, the, the presentation. This was, you know, really interesting, you know, went to the site. So, you know, kind of opened up uh, appears, you know, going to go ahead and sign in and, and try this out. A lot of things um, that you're doing right now really are, are interesting uh, from, you know, an NG talk, uh, national map products perspective, you know, building out those, a those AOIs, um, you know, haven't ever thought about somebody just, going and taking the entire US and saying, give me everything for that. Don't know how exactly we would respond to that. We, we tend to set uh, smaller size limits. Um, but like you said, you, you've had people just come in and take the full extent and, um, and go out for a coffee and come back and, and, and get their data a little later. Uh, so um, uh, again, I, I really do want to actually have a, a deeper dive with, uh, with the teams that built this and uh, the LP DAC uh, really appreciate uh, Chris, you and Tom, and and Tom for for organizing this today. Um, I think this is a fantastic example of that uh, Earth Science Partnerships in action. I agree, and uh, really thank Tom for the presentation today, and Chris for sharing a little bit about the DAX in general. Um, great, great partnership that Eros has had with NASA, and I think it was it was really nice to be able to highlight that in this forum. So, all well, right, thanks. everyone. Yep. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for participating. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next month.